How's everybody doing tonight? Are we all awake? We don't, we're not in food comas or anything like that right now. This is gonna be a little bit interactive, so I'm gonna need your participation. So I'm gonna start out by asking you a question, and I need total honesty and sincerity to come from you. How many of you ever in your life did something in lab that you were extremely embarrassed by? You can raise your hand, you can cry, you can shout it out, just let me know. All right, so that's, that's most of us in the room, right? For those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're liars and you can leave. So thank you, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna start out by telling you a story of something that happened during my first year of graduate school in 2001. Now at the time, I was really interested in joining a neurotransgenics lab that was really prominent and I knew that there were several students who were interested in joining the same lab. So at that time, I decided, in my own brilliance, as I often do, that I was gonna create a strategy to make sure that I stood out from the other students. So I designed a protocol that would run an experiment, not one, not two, but three experiments at the same time. I know, I'm a genius, we can talk later about how I did this, but finish the story and maybe you might not want to. So I set it up, I got there early, I set up all of the pipettes and all the test tubes, I got everything set up, and it probably took me about 30 minutes to get these experiments set up. And I was smug when I finished. Like I sat down and I looked at everything and I thought to myself, this PI is gonna think I am the best student he has ever interacted with in his life. And then I started smelling something. And I couldn't quite place what the smell was, but you know that term noxious odor? It smelled noxious, um, I turned around and looked, it seemed clear it was coming out of the fume hood. And that's when I remembered that in my brilliance, I had left out a detail. And the detail was, when you were making paraformaldehyde from scratch, how many of you know what I'm talking about, you're supposed to test the temperature of the hot plate because it gets to boiling very quickly, which means it can boil over, which means it can spill, which means it can come out of the fume hood and lead to a lab evacuation. So after the lab was evacuated <laughs> and we all got back, I really thought hard and I realized I did get that attention from the PI, but it was not exactly in the way that I had wanted. So I learned a really valuable lesson that day. And the lesson was that small details matter. When you're thinking about big picture ideas and you're thinking about your career and you see that light at the end of the tunnel, you can't step, skip steps in between. And I think that that's something that's a really common issue that a lot of us face is you're just so eager to get to the end that you want to skip over those small details and cut corners a little bit to try to get to the next step. But it never pays to miss those steps. And what I always say when I recount that story is that I was not humble and I did not respect science. And I think a lot of us know that the way to innovation in science is to understand those nuances and those little crooks and crannies that are in there. So that was a valuable lesson for me. So I was a first year grad student and I basically sort of maybe had to evacuate the lab, but that happens, right? I mean, has anybody else had a lab evacuation at any point? No? Oh. We'll talk afterwards, I wanna hear your story too. We're, we're a special club of people. But in that moment, after the lab was evacuated, instead of me sort of laughing it off and saying, oh my gosh, I'm a first year student, I actually didn't view it that way. Because at that time, I was the only underrepresented minority in the department. And so instead of me thinking, oh, well, I'm a first year grad student and I made a mistake, I instead internalized it and said, no one's gonna think I'm smart enough to be here. They're not gonna think that I'm as smart as the other students or I'm as good in lab as the other students or maybe they're gonna start making assumptions about how I got in here in the first place. And at that point in time, that's all that I could think and it consumed me and it really made me start to question my own abilities. Now that I'm an adult and I'm sort of separated from that, I know that what I was experiencing was imposter syndrome. And I can rationalize out why I was experiencing it and understand that it might not be the reality. But for many of you who are trainees in the audience, that experience was real. And it's not something, no matter how much you rationalize it, that you can just make go away. And it was something that I really had to dwell on and think about while I was in graduate school because I really was struggling with it when I first started out. And I kept having this thing running through my mind that my mom and my grandma would say, which was that sometimes when you're in a minority, it seems like you have to work twice as hard to be viewed just on equal footing with your peers. And that was something that I thought about a lot and I did not want to be paralyzed by that fear. 
So I took that knowledge and I decided two things. Number one, I never again wanted to miss a small detail. And number two, I really wanted to commit myself to creating learning environments for underrepresented students to be able to train where they did not have to be paralyzed by imposter syndrome. This was something that I knew was very important and something that I wanted to commit my life to. I don't want any of you to ever have to go through your life or your scientific career where this is something that limits your abilities and limits your vision of what you're able to do. I think if you're second guessing yourself, it should be about which reagent you use or which assay you use. It shouldn't be about if you belong somewhere based off of your gender or your race or how you identify or where you're from. Those are not obstacles that any of you should have to think about when you're pursuing a scientific career. And so what I hope is that many of you will be thinking about this as you're going through graduate school and beyond and understanding that many of us have experienced these feelings at some point or another and it's not the end of the road. So when you think about how do we make this work? How do we start creating learning environments where imposter syndrome is not paralyzing us from doing what we need to do? Well, my personal opinion is that we go back to the scientific method. So we're all scientists in this room and we know the scientific method works, right? Right? Do we practice it on a regular basis? It's been existing for centuries and centuries, right? So this is something that we know that works. So when we're thinking about diversity initiatives and programs and projects that are designed to help us, they should be looked at in the same way. We should have rigorous hypotheses and we should collect data and design experiments that have outcomes that we can test. And that's what will help us be innovative with diversity initiatives moving forward. I think that they will help us to look at education in a way that's different from the way it's previously been viewed, where diversity is an academic discipline that's viewed with the same rigor and intensity of us when we're working at the bench. In my opinion, that's the way that we will be able to take diversity to new heights and in innovation. I also think that for myself, I was very fortunate because I was able to design a career in this area that worked really well for me. So at Duke, I'm the director of the Office of Biomedical Graduate Diversity. And this is an office that deals with all diversity initiatives locally and nationally for the basic science and biomedical fields at the School of Medicine at Duke. My office has been a wonderful opportunity. We've been able to double the number of minority students at Duke through our work. We've been able to double the number of minority applications through our work. Our students are getting a huge number of fellowships. It's all been wonderful. I'm also, thank you. <laughs> I'm also one of the principal investigators of our IMSD program. And that gives me a chance to work with students every day, which I absolutely love, and to feel their energy and their enthusiasm for all the work that I'm doing. And I also do a lot of work with faculty and staff who are really supportive and engaged in my work. All of these people build to a bigger picture of the project of trying to increase diversity in the sciences. So this might sound great, but what I need you to understand is that this was a massive risk for me to take in my career. So my job did not actually exist before I created it. So when I was sitting out in all of your shoes trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, a job like this was not an option. And I knew that there was a possibility that I could be viewed as a young scientist who had made a massive mistake and was a huge failure along the way. But I had faith and I trusted my gut and I decided that I was gonna go for it and create something that was innovative and new that allowed me to do research and do diversity initiatives and build a career that I could be proud of as a faculty member. And I have to be honest, I was scared. How many of you all out here think that you might want to pursue careers that add lots of different things to research and not maybe just take a traditional path? So quite a few of you, wow, that's impressive. Well, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I may have cried at least once when I was trying to make up my mind. I may have hummed Jesus take the wheel by myself in my room, had a little bit of an emotional moment, but I don't regret for a second being fearless and going after something that didn't exist. And I really encourage you all to take that as you move forward with your careers. But in addition to that, my first boss, whose name is Donna Chikaraishi, believed so unwaveringly that I was going to be a success that I sort of did not have a choice but to be a success. These are the types of people that you need in your life. You need people who get you and you need to surround yourself with people who constantly uplift you and allow you to become the person that you need to be. 
So for me, every day, I'm surrounded by people who think that I'm doing great work and also think I'm a little bit crazy. And that works for me, believe me, it works really well. Half of those people are sitting over there at that table. Yeah, they think I'm crazy, it's fine. Um, I have students and staff who come to me for all types of support and guidance, and I really enjoy working with them. We talk about everything from scientific decisions to them teaching me how to use Bitmojis on my phone, which I did not even know actually existed until recently. Um, they also have been teaching me different things about being a cool faculty member, such as on fleek is no longer in style. I guess that was gone in 2014 or something like that. I don't know. Can anybody help me out here? It's gone? Okay, well, thank you. You're helping me out as well. For the faculty that I work with, we talk about all different types of things. We go and talk about diversity and we talk about science, but we also talk about things like Battlestar Galactica. These are people who are great colleagues, and at the end of the day, they're all working towards a common goal of just helping me to realize the full version of who I am, which is really, at the end of the day, what we want all of you to be doing on a regular basis. But even in addition to that, there are mentors. And how many of you all, by a round of applause, have mentors who have made massive differences in your life? Yes. <laughs> I have so many mentors who I call on for guidance on a daily basis that I am in fear that I'm probably gonna get blocked from some people's phones pretty soon. Shout out to Cliff Poudry, who might be blocking me right now. He's kind of like looking down like I am actually blocking you from my phone as we speak. But these are people who have helped me to lose the fear in my career. And they've helped me to be able to see, instead of looking at the world as impossibilities and scary challenges, I look at things as exciting opportunities that I can grow from and learn and innovate and be able to change. These are the types of people that take you from being good to being great. So what I really encourage all of you to do while you're at this SACNIS meeting is take advantage of all the people that are here and build those mentor-mentee relationships. They're, this is a great place to do it, and this is to get you on your path to greatness. But there's something else to think about, too. As diverse individuals from diverse backgrounds, our greatest strength in the scientific community is our diversity. It's a strength. It's not a burden or a weakness. No one will ever view the world the same way that we do. And they won't think about science the same way that we do. I know that there were times when I was in graduate school and during my postdoc and I would be thinking about designing experiments. And sometimes it might come from me reading a paper, but a lot of times it would come from the fact that I have a level of creativity and innovation that I've gained through life experiences where I may have had to be more resourceful than other people have been in the past. And going along with that, I think we have another gift that we need to harness and that a lot of us don't talk about, which is our family and our community support. Now, I don't know about you all, but my, yes, clap for the families. And I know that there are some parents here tonight, so that's especially, that's especially nice. I'm gonna tell you about my family, and hopefully you, well, we'll talk about if you do this with your, with your students or not. So my brother and my sister text me, call me, and or harass me every single day, pretty much. Um, but you know, the thing is, having their support has really helped me to continue to go. And even now that I'm a faculty member, and I'm running my own research and my own office and my own grants, still to this day, if I call my parents and I tell them I have a big deadline coming up, they show up at my house, they cut my grass, they cook me food, they let me get sleep, that is not me being a baby. That is me thanking God that I have people who love me and want to provide me with support along the way. They are not scientists. This is not something that they can identify with. But they just know that this is something that's going to help overall and they want to be a part of my journey. Let your families be part of your journey. Do not think as a scientist that that has to go away. That's really, really, really important. Definitely. I'll also tell you, for me, with my family, whenever my mom comes, it means I get gumbo. It might be empanadas for you or something else, but anybody who turns down fresh gumbo, you're dead to me, so you really don't need to be here anyway. But, yeah, thank you. Another Creole person in the house, that's great. But even outside of the family support, my immediate family, I think a lot about the legacy of my family. So if you look at my family lineage, we have triumphed over slavery, segregation, racism, and injustice, and we're still here. And this is something...
And I didn't really understand how important that was until my grandfather, who was 89, passed away two years ago. And I found out from my grandmother that he carried very few things, but when he passed away, they got his wallet. And the thing that was inside of his wallet was my first business card because it said PhD after my name. And So I'm the first person to get a PhD on either side of my family ever in history. How many of you all are going to be the first people in your families to get a PhD? Let's hear a cheer for all of you. It's not a small deal. And that's the reason why I said you've got to let your families be a part of this process because it means just as much to you as it does to them. And every time you face a challenge or a bump in the road, let them be a part of your journey and harness their strength because that is another special aspect that you will have that other people will not be able to experience in the same way. And so as I wrap up, I will just say this. The next time that you spill the paraformaldehyde in your lab, or as I'll tell you about another time, that you have an animal to escape that might or might not be high on cocaine that you're chasing across the lab. We'll talk about that later. Um, any sort of disaster in the lab, or let's say that you're struggling on an exam and you'd feel like you can't make it, or you're applying to graduate school and you are crippled with imposter syndrome of thinking that you might not be good enough to get in or you don't really know if you understand how you're going to get from point A to point B, or in general you just feel that you're not good enough or you're not smart enough, any of those feelings, you need to know we have all been there. It does not mean that you don't belong. It means that you are a scientist and it's part of the journey. And what I want to say finally is that you are all enough just as you are and you are going to change the world. And I'm so proud to be here in front of all of you to say that I want to be a part of that journey with you. Thank you very much.